Hello, Bristol Bay fishermen. Um, I'm Andy Wink with the BBRSBA, uh, the executive director. And we wanted to make a video today to talk about the market information that we, that we provide. Um, I'm also joined here with one of our members, Eric Sabo. Um, Eric, do you wanna tell people a little bit about yourself and how you kind of use this, this data and why you think it's important? Yeah, I'd be happy to, Andy. Um, good morning. Uh, I, I, I've been a fisherman for uh, 20 some years on my own boat. And uh, over the years, I've seen a lot of changes uh, from being on, a, on the deck when Japanese froze fish, uh, when canned fish was the primary product coming out. And, and we've come so full circle um, that following our market and what you were doing with McDowell and now with the RSDA uh, is invaluable to know where our fishing um, industry is, uh, if we're getting our fair share. Uh, it, it's, it's invaluable to me to know that our business is healthy. Definitely. Well, we did a, uh, a survey about a year, a little over a year ago now, and, you know, this was coming off the 2020 season, and we heard from the fleet that, you know, understanding market transparency or market data condition, uh, market conditions, you know, that was the top of the list. People want to know, you know, where, where's this at, right? Um, what's going on? So we do our best to try to provide as much information in one place as efficiently as possible. And so that's, but I think there's, you know, the reason for this video today is we also need to help our members and the fishermen be able to understand and sort of read that data. And Eric's uh, always had really good insights and questions over the years. So I invited him to kind of join me in this. Um, so I'm going to share up my screen here. We're just going to walk through what we provide. And I think that will be helpful for you guys. So you, get, you know, so you get the most out of what we do and what you're funding us. Um, in this case to do. Yeah, before you do that, Andy, I'll back up and I'll say, uh, you know, if if people are watching and they see my name, they probably know that I was a huge uh, opponent of the RSDA and the tax that we paid for that. And I, I've come full circle as well, because with this information and with what we're doing with Pebble, I think if people want to ask how their 1% is being used, this is a great place to start about, you know, knowing where our money's going, how it's being spent by the RSDA. And I, this is really valuable information that it's hard to get and, and you know, collate and get into a, a, a chart that you do. It's, it, it would take us hours and hours and you do a great job. So I appreciate that. Before well, we I get into that this. Too, and I, yeah, no, I, I really, I always really appreciate, you know, the, to the extent there's been criticisms here and there, and we still hear that today, right? But I just, I appreciate when it's fair and, and sometimes it's just uninformed. Usually it's just, you know, that's where folks are coming from. They just maybe don't know everything we're doing or they don't know why we're doing it. And so, you know, we've tried to be as, we try to put as much emphasis on outreach without taking away from the actual doing. Um, because what we've seen is when the more collaboration and involvement we get from the fleet, the better our projects are um, the, the more they really hit the mark and also the more participation that we can get. And to be honest, we're not at the top of the mountain there. I, we've got a ways to go, but I think we're getting better. Um, so, you know, with that, let's kind of jump into this. Um, so here's our homepage. The first thing you got to do to get the data that, that um, Eric and I are talking about here is go to bbrsda.com. And there's a whole lot to this page that we could take a long time to explain, but what we're gonna focus on today is uh, the market and value page. So you go to For the Fleet Market and Value Info, and that's gonna uh, bring you here. Um, and so, you know, as Eric mentioned in the past, I wrote uh, periodic market reports. <laughs> Sometimes those were 50 pages or more, very in depth. Um, a lot of people read them, but not everybody did. Uh, I'd probably say most people didn't. And so what we're trying to do these days is be a lot more efficient with just, you know, really zeroing down in on the information that is going to be most relevant and useful for you guys. Um, so we've created this page. Typically, there will be some commentary, some summary about market conditions at the top of the page. 
but not always. And so I don't really want to worry too much about where the market's at right now today with kind of the summary, because that's going to change from time to time. Um, but, you know, when we can summarize it, we do. But really what we're going to focus on today is this, uh, this data section here and all of the tables and charts that are within that. Um, so, so why don't we start off with the first one, what we call the Bristol Bay uh, Sockeye Scorecard. And um, what this is really is a, a table that shows first wholesale sales by month. You know, this is kind of the heart of the data here. And, um, and so this is when a processor sells it to a company that's outside of their affiliated network or that they don't, you know, own a part of. And that's adding it up in dollars across all major Bristol Bay Sockeye products by month. And, and we've done this from June through May because obviously fish are caught in June and July and then sold in the following month. So when you add all that up, you, you know, are able to see that, okay, in 2015, it was worth 355 million. We start going up almost to 600, then we're down. And we can also track how that's, how that's flowing in recent months. And this, you know, these, this column is probably the most important for where we stand right here today. Um, and we can see that, you know, things have been moving at higher values in recent months than they did last year um, and in 2019. So that's, that's a good sign. And uh, we can also see that, you know, the volume is about steady from 2020, but quite a bit higher than 2019. So, you know, you can kind of use these, these data down here um, as the year to date, the harvest year to date to get a sense of, are we ahead of the curve? Is product moving faster and at higher values or slower and at lower values? And then of course, how does that compare to what fishermen got and caught up here? So Eric, what's your kind of, you know, take on this page? What do you see yeah. here? What questions might you have? I, when I look at this page, Andy, I go right to that 5.8 million in June in 2021. And I look at, you know, the last five years and I say, wow, really low. What that tells me is inventories were low and they didn't have a lot to sell, but they got rid of it. And then, and then I jump right to the 126 and I say, wow. And I look at that and it, it beat every year uh, in the last six for August sales. And that's, that's the first big sales month coming out of our season. So it'll be really interesting to see um, September and October, because I think July, August, September, October, November are really your most important months for the sales season. And that's what sticks out to me when I look at this page. That's a really great point and something we'll probably touch on as we see some other data um, in a little bit. But you're absolutely right. You know, a lot of that June sales is fresh product, but it's also frozen product that's being sold out prior to the next harvest year. And um, we actually have another price sheet where we didn't have data for, I believe, like April, May, June, or, you know, March, April, May, which is weird. And probably because there wasn't any inventory left to really have enough sales to make it, um, to make it reportable. So, so yeah, and then, you know, you can use this data to, he to sort of verify or validate what you're hearing anecdotally, right? And what we've heard anecdotally is there's not a lot of spot inventory around. A lot of the product is, is spoken for. And I think that 126.6 uh, you know, million figure you mentioned, you know, that probably supports, you know, supports a lot of that anecdotal uh, info. So, so yeah, very, you know, we probably, this is, this is one of the most important data sets I think that we put out because it probably provides the, the best, um, you know, snapshot of, of the total first wholesale sales in, in terms of total dollars. And before we move on, I'll just say that we get this data. This data comes from the Alaska Salmon Price Reports, which we have a link to on this page. Um, but it only comes out three times a year in like four month batches. So, you know, it's going to be a while until we know how things stood um, through December. You know, we probably won't get that data till late February. Um, 
but so far, so very good, I would say, is according to this data. Yeah, so this is the real nuts and bolts. Yeah, yeah, uh, keep going. Yeah, this is the real nuts and bolts, and, and I think you're going to uh, click to the graphs. I really like the graphs that this nuts and bolts pages um, shows. Um, but if you want to know what the graph yeah, is, there, you go man. back to that nuts and bolts. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. And those percentages were on that page, at least for the more current years. Um, but this is probably one of the, this is probably the graphic that I use the most when it comes to market data, because fishermen often ask, you know, okay, what do we get out of what the resource is worth, right? What's our end of it? And this just tracks that over time. So the blue bars are base and quality bonuses and adjustments paid to fishermen. And then the gray bars are uh, the first wholesale sales value for that harvest year, less what was paid to fishermen. So we, we call this, this gray bar territory net processing revenue, um, you know, in, in some other places on the page. But it really kind of gives you a sense of the, you know, gross margin or maybe working capital that it's sort of a proxy for the working capital that processing sector would bring into the next season. So, you know, yeah, what, uh, what else do you see about this page before we dive into it a little further, Eric? Yeah, I, I, I love this chart, Andy. Um, I worked, I, I shared with you years ago, you know, my, um, I guess, uh, spreadsheets uh, of the salmon production report. And, and what, what a lot of people don't realize is the salmon production report has a lot of redacted information. It's just a lot of blanks. And you, you go to great lengths um, to fill in some of those gaps. So your, your charts were always more accurate than mine. And when I look at this chart, and we didn't see a lot of these charts um, because nobody put them together like this um, until you started doing it, to my knowledge. And when I look at this chart, then I hit my memory bank and I say, okay, I remember in 2014 when the processors were paying $1.50 a pound and, I, and they were telling us we overpaid after that season. And, and, and this chart just directly reflects that. They overpaid in 2014. We got 74% of that, uh, you know, year's, you know, value that they overpaid us and, and we paid the price the next year because they paid us 50 cents and, the, and, and they made up for it, you know, with 30, we got 35% on the 50 cent year. And, and that just blew a lot of people out of the water. But this chart really reflects what happened. And, and you can see that the, the processors were really fighting. They, they were trying to recover some of their losses probably for 2014, because I'm sure they had losses. Um, they won't tell you that, but this chart tells you. And, and, then, mm -hmm. and then we're coming back to kind of normal re ranges of, you know, you see in early or mid 2000s, we were getting 40, 42%, 44. And now, and now in 2020, we're back to that 40. Um, you know, 58, 62 in 2000, 2019 are good, are good percentages. We got our fair share. You can't argue we didn't if you look at the history of this chart. So I love this chart. Yeah, it's a, you know, I'm glad you kind of told the story of 14, 2014 and 15, because I remember that pretty vividly too, being in a, uh, you know, doing a market report in Dillingham pr prior to the 2015 season, you know, and, and it, it, it cut off right here, right? We didn't know what this was going to look like. <laughs> I said, I don't, I'm not yeah. going to make a price prediction for you guys and what the market's going to bear, but it's going to be brutal, right? Because look at, this, yeah, this shrinking margin. <laughs> so I switched um, my hat, but then, um, to Peter. Yeah, I see that. Is, uh, is that Andy, current for you? <laughs> I no. Well, this is a current hat, but uh, no, and it's not me currently. But I remember specifically in 2015, going into that season, Peter Pan was in Dillingham telling guys, "Do not spend money. Do not get your expenses out of line," because they knew that they had to lower their price, but, and they did that. And Peter Pan was up front with their guys and said that. And, and I switched my hat to Peter Pan because Peter Pan was out there telling guys, uh, don't, mm -hmm. don't get too excited about this next year. Luckily we had a huge season that made up volume wise, but, um, 
you know, our, our, our companies, whether Ocean Beauty uh, or uh, Trident, which I'm currently, uh, you know, what our fleet managers are telling you before season um, also foreshadow a lot of times what's going to happen. Um, that's why when we go to Fish Expo and you present this information, we're all listening to what what's happening. Uh, and, and it gives us a really good indication of what's going to come this spring with the forecast coming out. So I love this chart, Andy. Well, thank you. And I think, I think there's a really good um, learning moment here and a really good takeaway from this that you know kind of talks to the the situation that that we're both talking about um and, and i you know also before that other than prior to that season when we were you know in dillingham presenting this information um we also were at pacific marine expo now granted this was kind of pre-zoom days but i remember that very vividly too and you almost had to shout that year to be able to have conversations on the show floor because it was so busy and like there was so much business going on and we were in this little room underneath the stadium, tucked away, and we were talking about, you know, I was talking about market conditions and going, you know, gosh, even in November, it was like, this does not look very good. The dollar had changed dramatically as, uh, you know, versus other currencies, stuff wasn't moving, going back to that other page, you know, but that type of data was starting to show some real alarm bells. And we probably had like, you know, 20, 30 fishermen in the room following along kind of, you know, grimacing and not real happy about what I was saying. But meanwhile, everyone was, you know, writing big checks out on the show floor. And I think I even said at one point, like, I really wish we could like get all those folks here to like hear this information. You know, at the end of the day, you're going to do what you're going to do. It's free country. I just want to make sure you guys are working with as much information as possible. Yeah. So. No, that was a, and hey, just like COVID, COVID, COVID did the same thing to us, you know, we all, but it was more transparent with COVID because we all knew there were going to be hurdles to, to take uh, that year. And, and the processors on those kind of years, when that stuff's happening, you know, in, in the mid sales season, um, they approach it cautiously. They approach 2015 very cautiously, just like they approached 2020. And you can see it um, in this chart if you look carefully. Right. Yeah. And because this one's such an important chart, you know, I don't, I, I want to make sure we kind of cover everything that's here. And I, I would also say, you know, 2020, the data is what it is. This, this money you guys earned and that the processors earned is no less real than other years, but it's also, it was a very black swan year. You know, you had the pandemic, which had a massive impact on the amount of risk that everybody's willing to take. And you guys don't get as much choice in that as, others further down the supply chain. But the other thing that people probably don't didn't hear as much about is the harvest, the salmon harvest elsewhere in Alaska were brutal outside of the Bay. It was the lowest harvest uh, since 1979, if you take out Bristol Bay in 2020. So, you know, again, it is what it is. But when you look at 2018 and 2019, you know, another question is like, how competitive is the Bristol Bay fishery and the Bristol Bay, you know, uh, fishermen and, and processing uh, uh, relationship. And this suggests that as value has gone up, right, as more revenues being made, the, the share of raw material and the share going to raw material producers has come up as well, right? So there's, there, there appears to be some, some competitive uh, juices pushing, you know, pushing up that percentage. You, you know, you guys didn't just get 42 to 45% which is, you know, what happened in the past as that value shot up, both processors and fishermen yeah. did, did better, but you guys did better on a percentage basis. Yeah. And we want to, and we, you see that. And, and as a fisherman, you want to say, why is that happening? And if you look back at, I think when you will get to it, but when we look at the nuts and bolts again, we're going to see the separation of the price between Bristol Bay and frozen sockeye and the farm stuff. And I think that's an important metric because um, we're not competing like we were in the mid 2000s with farm now. We're, we're, we're getting that identification away from farm fish. And I, I think we're seeing on the retail end. Yeah, that's a good point. Let's, let's move on and go there. Um, 
And uh, I'll just say that this little PDF table here, it's really just the chart in table form. So if you wanna see the numbers behind it, it's there. Um, so let's skip down to the retail stuff since we're talking about that. So this page is the promotional prices. You know, the, the, when you get a grocery circular ad uh, booklet in the, the mail or in your, in your uh, inbox, this company, Erner Berry, they put that into a database from a bunch of stores around the country. And so we're able to like download, okay, what is the ad prices for sockeye and, and Atlantic salmon? And then we can average that over months or quarters or years. Um, and it's kind of interesting when you make a time series out of it. So like what Eric was saying was, you know, we used to have a lot tighter spread between um, sockeye and, and Atlantic of uh, uh, salmon prices. And we've really seen that widen out. You know, this is the difference just in, in dollars. We're now up to, uh, you know, nearly $5. Now I will say this quarter four is only like three or four weeks of data. I haven't had a chance to update this. It goes through October 19th. Um, but even still like quarter three is a full quarter and you know, we're, we're looking at big premiums here. So that's yeah. in a way good. That's news. exciting to me. Could it come down and compress? Yeah, it's great. It will, hopefully we can hold it or grow it as much as we can. Um, but you were, you were talking about how, you know, you feel like sockeye has become not necessarily, you know, not as much a competitor or linked to farm salmon, but it's more because, you know, ha has its own consumer base, its own demand base. And maybe you could speak a little more about that. Yeah. I, I, like I said, I like that. That's the most exciting thing that I see. Uh, when I look at the retail market is that we're separating away from farm fish because I remember, um, and, and it really was part of the 2000, 2001 crash in our, in our fishery, the, the introduction of farm fish and farm fish taking over the retail market and Japan turning to farm fish for their consumption. And we didn't have a domestic market for fillets then. And, and our development of fillets and our, and our movement into the, the, our domestic market has been huge for us in Bristol Bay, especially in conjunction with what Andy said earlier. Um, Bristol Bay has been steady for really steady for the last 10, 12 years compared to other fisheries uh, in Alaska that have been boom, bust, boom, bust. Yeah, it's an interesting point you bring up about Japan too, because you know, another thing that we hear a lot from fishermen is, you know, how good things were back in the 80s and early 90s. Um, and I haven't had a chance to really put up a whole article or analysis of that. But what I will say, to the extent that I've looked into it is, you know, when you look at the export data, virtually all of it appeared to have gone to, um, to Japan, as far as the frozen H&G sockeye. And there was more frozen Asian G stock I caught back in those days than people probably think, you know, the conventional thing is, well, it all went into cans. Well, no, no, it didn't. A lot of it was still frozen, but all of that went to Japan or nearly, nearly all of it. Now I think Japan is probably down to like less than 10%, maybe single digits as far as where our production and even just exports go. Um, it's a small fraction. You know, and of course, can production is now, you know, way down as well, maybe below 10 or 15%, depending on the year. So, yeah, things were really good back then. Farm salmon was not really much of a thing in most of the world, right? We had a lot more of the market to ourselves, I suppose. Um, but I think that if, if there's a success story here, just being where we're at, that the industry has been able to essentially lose its two primary markets. Um, and the farm yep. fish we're talking about in Japan, it's farm coho from Chile. That's, you know, almost completely supplanted sockeye in Japan. Um, and then of course, canned is, is not so much a thing anymore, but yet here we are and doing well. And, you know, this, this, so, so this data really speaks to like, you know, our domestic market, where that's at. Um, I'll say, you know, the, the other thing that fishermen talk a lot about, right, Eric, is 
okay, the price between what fishermen get paid and what the, the retail price is. So we, we have this line here that really sort of just quantifies that spread. Um, because when you guys catch a fish, it takes two round pounds to essentially make one pound of fillets. So you kind of have to take your ex vessel price and double it before you compare it to a fillet uh, price. So yeah, no, I think that that's a great a metric, right? There. <laughs> yeah, and there's a lot in the middle, but there's also a lot that that happens because of that. Um, you know, you guys catch. 70, 100, 400,000 pounds in a season. Some, you know, some of like a seafood counter might sell, might sell as little as 20 pounds a week of sockeye, you know, um, might, might sell 50, but it, there's that last mile aspect of it. There's smaller economies of scale than you'd probably think. Um, and that's not to excuse any of it. Hopefully, if someone can figure out a better mousetrap for getting, you know, sockeye that are uh, in strong demand, right, <laughs> to consumers, then so be it. But at least this gives you a sense of how the trend is tracking, you know. Um, yeah, exactly. I, I think that's why the charts I love, because it, it gives us a historical trend. And, and, and if there is an anomaly, we can ask ourselves, well, why did that anomaly occur? Like, I think we can probably say, you know, we've seen a bump in the uh, supermarket prices, the retail market prices, but part of that bump has to accommodate just from what we're reading in the news about supply chain and the, and the shortage of drivers and trucks. So, I mean, a portion of the, I mean, all our fillets down here have gone up a dollar, dollar fifty a pound, but part of that has to be in shipping costs. It's, it, we, we can't reasonably expect to say, oh, we're going to get all of that or even a third of it, because a lot of it has to go towards the higher cost of shipping. That's, that's a very good point. You know, it's when you're looking at this stuff, it's, it's not all because of fishermen, you know, it, the growth is not certainly all because of DBRSDA or those sorts of things or marketing or quality or whatever. Um, you know, it's just, it's where the market's going. Those things influence it, but no single thing is very often the sole driver. So on the next page of this, we really just kind of summarize out um, I, again that that margin a little bit more, um, you know, breaking it down on a harvest year basis, um, and then down here we kind of walk through the supply chain, the the sort of price points at the as you go through the supply chain. So, you know, again that raw material cost. If you're looking at a fillet, what is the amount of excess value or cost that is in that that fillet well you kind of multiply the round price by two um, and then okay so what is the ho first wholesale frozen fillet price at um, and these numbers you know we'll, we'll update them as time goes on we had to sort of estimate them for 2020 at the time being but then we kind of break that down to say okay here's a shit you know here's who gets what of the of the retail value um, and, you know, that's a question that fishermen ask, and we want to try to provide the data. We're not, I, you know, I, I can't say it's, the market's going to do what it's going to do. These percentages are going to be what they're going to be. We're just the reporters of it. So, um, you know, that's kind of what this page is about. Do you have any questions or any yeah. things that you kind of, that you see here, Eric? You know, I, I again, I think this is just a great nuts and bolts pages for those that want to look a little bit further into what our market's doing. And like you said, a lot of times some things can't be explained, but every once in a while there's a blip and you're like, what? What's going on there? Um, but but the trend is our friend. Right. And if it's going up, it, it's good. And if it's going down, then we should take note. And because we're a cyclical business and uh, we've been on a real uptrend and I hope it continues. But there are a lot of things that explain that. And, uh, you know, part of what Andy said, you know, we've had really good runs, really good production. Um, and, and our prices have been pretty good when you compare it to the production. But 
if if we were a cook inlet um we would be suffering and um and maybe cook inlet inlet would be reaping all the rewards from this market because the demand for sockeye is good um it's just supply and right and yeah, I think you're right. You know, trend being your friend and you can learn a lot from where you're at versus the trend or versus the average. And if you were to look at this data, um, you know, probably towards the beginning of this year, of beginning of 2021, you would have saw this starting to take shape, you know, heading into the 2020 season, you would have saw that, well, wait a minute, fishermen are getting, you know, the fisherman sector is getting a lower, much lower percentage than it has in a while of the, the retail value. The retail prices are very strong. You know, well, last time that happened in 2016, we saw the, the X vessel value increase quite a bit, right? Like that, that kind of came back because people were more mm -hmm. being more competitive for those fish. They were, hey, there's, there's money to be made further down the supply chain. They went and got them and, you know, you, you saw like things happen in reaction to each of these situations. Um, so, and the thing I'll say about retailers getting that percentage of it, um, you know, again, if someone can build a better mousetrap, it's a free country and they, they should go do it. But, you know, if you think retailers are making, you know, a, a killing on it, um, they're, a lot of them are publicly traded. You can buy stock in a, you know, Kroger or, um, well, you know, a, well, I'll a jump in, Andy, I, so, you know. <laughs> I've never seen so many um, uh, fishermen uh, doing their own marketing uh, with the help of the RSDA's materials and, and their energy. You, you've seen a lot of, I, I can name two or three that have been quite successful in the last 10 years starting their own deal um, and, and going after that, you know, 40 some percent. They're saying, hey, I want a part of that. And if they want to start spending their weekends at farmers markets and if they can uh, ensure that they can get a supply of it after the season, man, there's, there's some money to be made, but it's, it, it takes a lot and, but guys are doing it and they're doing pretty good if they, you know, work hard at it. Yeah. We always tend to see those, the direct number of direct marketers come up when this, you know, when this starts getting to these levels, it's a natural reaction, like you say. And, um, so, so again, something probably useful here to keep an eye on in terms of what's coming um, and, and also what maybe opportunities might be out there, like you mentioned with the, with the direct marketers. So, so let's, uh, let's kind of go back to our, our page here and um, one chart or table that we um, work with on or we support with Bristol Bay Fish, Fishermen's Association is the price table by processor. So you know, a lot of you guys have probably seen this. Um, this is the chart from 2020. So you're going to see here that obviously we know that price was a function of production uh, for a lot of the companies. But if you're wondering, okay, what is the market price for Bristol Bay Sockeye? Well, of course, that's going to depend on each buyer has a different, you know, pricing structure. A lot of times they're very similar or the same, but but this gives you that information. Um, so, you know, Eric, what's your kind of fisherman perspective on, on this? On, on the, well, I think, I think <laughs> us fishermen, you know, whether we're Ocean Beauty, uh, Trident, <laughs> Peter Pan, uh, we, we constantly talk. And this is where this information comes from. Fishermen talking to one another. Um, you know, how did you get paid? Uh, we, we, just, we just saw a huge, huge um, departure from the norm this last, you know, month with a, 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 base, a base price adjustment across the board by most of the major companies of 20 cents. Now, we never saw, I, I, I can't recall a year where we've seen a base price adjustment. So this, this chart just reflects what we talk about all year long um, between fishermen. I have friends that fish for every one of these companies and, and I can ask them and say, well, how, how's your price? Where did it come out? Because, you know, if one, and we saw it with Leader Creek when Leader Creek came in and they started leading the price, a bunch of guys went over there 
And when Silver Bay came in and they said, well, we're going to we're going to be competitive and we're going to give you an ownership stake. A lot of guys move that way. The only the only political power we have as fishermen is the choice of who we fish for. So this is an extremely important uh, chart um, that reflects what we all talk about all year long. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, this is something that a lot of fishermen do know because, you know, people talk and, and this data is crowdsourced. Um, but I think the, the benefit of it is that at least it puts it in one place. It's, it tries to be as comprehensive as possible. And so if you don't have as much of that network, or maybe you can't remember what, you know, who said what about um, the different price points, you know, that's here for you. Um, but let's, uh, yeah. let's keep and, moving on. And, and these are all, is here. I will say, Oh, sorry, Andy. I will say that, you know, no, um, when, when, when the BBFA creates that, um, that's just, you know, they're, they're, they're really getting it just from their uh, membership um, and, and BBRSDA, uh, you know, pays for it. Um, and it's not always as accurate as it should be. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff some years that aren't in there. Um, uh, particularly particularly with production bonus stuff a lot of the production bonus stuff just is never disclosed right and to that point you know there's a note here that says you know contact the office um you know contact bbfa if you have a correction or more information the better that the fleet can be informed about where the market's at the better it's you know the the more competitive it's going to be uh frankly so you know, this is this is a brick in in that infrastructure, in that market information yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, infrastructure. So, uh, let's look at export data. Um, the nice thing about export data is that it comes out each month, and it doesn't lag too bad. I think it's usually about a month to two months behind. But you know, we have data through October on the total exports of frozen sockeye that went out of the US um, to other countries. So yeah. you know, volume up here at the top, seven million and a half pounds uh, went out last month or, or in October. And you know, we see how that sort of, you know, July, August, September are the big months here. That's when most of it gets exported. Um, so that starts to allow us to, to see something, you know, what's developing for 2021 that the year we're in here um, and, and what's the volume and value of that. So we can see that we're kind of ahead of the pace from last year. And it's nice in a way that we caught like it was about a 200 million pound harvest in both 2020 and 2021. So we don't really have to like think too much about, okay, there was different harvest volumes here. It was just more was exported faster this year. Um, but not as much as, you know, some of these years prior, uh, but a lot more revenue being generated from those exports when you look down here, you know, mm -hmm. um, I think that's the most important thing to take from that. Right. Because the, the quicker you can turn inventory into cash flow and, and revenue, you know, the better off for, for, for any business. Right. And so when you have to sit on it a long time, you know, discount it, have storage costs, have insurance, all that sort of stuff. Um, that just that just eats away at the value of the entire, you know, product and resource. Um, you know, so things are looking, I'd say, good. Now, when you start to compare it to too many years back, like, you know, these harvests in 14, 15, 16, and 13, I mean, those were much lower harvest volumes. 2018, 2019 were actually higher. There was more pounds of fish caught those years so it makes sense they'd be a little higher um but even if you were to kind of go through and put this in your own spreadsheet and adjust it, it the the growth in the domestic market demand you know that probably pulls product away from export markets so it's not necessarily a bad thing if we don't see strong export data you have to kind of consider other you know the, the u.s market as well yeah but it does give us a good proxy for price. I do like the fact, the, the one thing I like about this is it, 
it, this data comes out faster, you know, to have to wait three months sometimes for the salmon production. This gives us a really, um, unfortunately, but you have to extract out and you have to kind of fill in the gap knowing how much percentage of Bristol Bay stuff this is. I mean, you could, you know, because if Fraser River was a strong year, I mean, that's Canada, so we don't have that in, in this. But let's say, you know, Cook Inlet was good and uh, Kodiak was good and False Pass was good. Then then this doesn't matter as much to us. Well, that's a great point, actually, Eric, because last year, other fish, other sockeye fisheries in Alaska weren't very good in 2020, yeah. right? And they weren't great in 2021 either, but they were a lot better than 2020. So you know, there was more sockeye to be exported. Um, so that's part of it. The other thing I want to mention down here in pricing, you know, this is not really price so much as, as it is just total dollars yeah. exported divided by pounds. So, you know, there's a big difference in market price between a two to four pound H and G and a four to six pound H and G. And if that distribution is off from month to month, which, you know, it's not always going to be the same, then that's probably going to push around prices a little bit. So I wouldn't say this is like a true apples to apples price um, proxy or, or indicator, but it's, it's pretty good. I mean, it gives us a sense of, you know, are things relatively higher or lower? Yeah. You know? And then, and again, we can compare it to, the other metrics that we know from the salmon production report and, and your charts to see if everything's kind of fallen in line. Right. And over here at these, at the end, we can kind of see, okay, for, you know, starting in July, where have things, you know, been July through uh, October, kind of that harvest year to date. And so we can see that, well, you know, they're up quite a bit, uh, almost at four bucks versus 334. Yeah, no, it's that, and that's, that's a huge, that's a great, you know, spot. And, and I always go back to 2015, right? Cause that's a, that was just a blip in the screen with that year. And you, you see that's at way down to 234 uh, from the previous 295, you know, so that, that again, that's reflected what happened to us. Yeah, it's very interesting. And even when things got to 320 and then came back, oh boy, you know, it, I mean, this 320, that, that was, a, I think, a, about a 90 million pound harvest year. Yeah. You know, very little supply, right? So it kind of makes sense that the value and the price would be up, or that the price would be up that much. Um, yeah. Constrained supply. But now we're way above that and, you know, much higher harvest. So very interesting. Yeah. But let's, uh, let's kind of, you know, we, we, we just mentioned supplies. So that's another thing that you'll find data on on this page. You'll see what, you know, see how much sockeye was caught from all the different major producers. You know, Bristol Bay tends to be half to two thirds of the uh, global supply. You can see that here. Um, Russia also catches a lot of sockeye. And then, of course, other regions in Alaska. Uh, Canada used to, they, they used to have this really odd, you know, once every five year thing. Now they hardly catch anything. Same with other areas in uh, Pacific Northwest. So, yeah. well, I, rem I remember that, you know, Fraser River, that was, that was, those were those big years in Canada when Fraser River hit then, and, and every processor would tell us, well, we don't know because this is a Fraser River year. We have to wait for Fraser River to see what happens before we really can set a price. So, um, yeah. And that, that is it, exactly what happened in 2014. I remember mm -hmm. that very vividly where it seemed like the market was just waiting. You know, you weren't seeing as much sales volume in the time, in the months you t generally expect it. And then Fraser River went off and it just kind of seemed like, well, I don't know. I think our product, you know, that 74% thing that we saw on the chart here going back. Um, yeah. You know, I, I don't think all the fish caught in 2014 were necessarily sold in that harvest year. You know, some of it was probably sold the next year. Um, 
so yeah, we, we can't really account for like carryover inventory and that sort of thing. But, you know, still it, it just, you know, when you start to blend these different data sets or when you start to look at one versus the other, you'll start to, you know, the picture starts to fill in, I, I think. And that's what we're talking about here today. We want to teach yep. you guys how to see that. Yep. Yeah. I, I, I completely agree. If, if you're interested, if fishermen are interested, if they just look at this quarterly and just look through the numbers, just like you read the newspaper, you get a feel for what is going on, you know, and, and if you look at the picture, it, it makes a trend and you get a good feeling. I get a good sense of what's going on because I've been looking at this stuff for 20 years and I've been looking at the nuts and bolts and trying to understand them because I didn't. And, and with Andy's help and, and his charts and presentations with supply, price, um, <laughs> uh, denominations or monetary values, uh, currency values, uh, it all starts making sense, but you got to put all the pieces together and it's all here. You just got to get a good feel for it. Yeah, and I will say, I mean, it's a good point, Eric, you know, or good advice for fishermen, come and check this out quarterly, you know, every once in a while. And just like you read the newspaper, um, you know, one thing I think we have to be careful of is RSDA and myself, um, as you know, the one that puts a lot of this together, I, I will put the disclaimer on I am, this is not financial advice, and I'm not a financial advisor. Uh, <laughs> because if you ask me where we stand right now, and where we're going, like it's, you know, I, my crystal ball has got more numbers in it and is maybe more informed, but it's not perfectly clear either. Um, you really have to read into this and decide what you think about it. And, you know, I, I just, we, we can't, well, it would be hard for us to do this and say, you know, six months from now, I can tell you exactly how the market's going to unfold <laughs> based on this. Yeah. No, it's a very dynamic market is what you really need to understand. And, and we're dealing with mother nature. So, um, and, and our chums didn't show up this last year, you know? Right. But this data will give you a better sense of that, of where it's yeah. come from and where it's, you know, where, where we're headed. Uh, but I just want to make sure people don't, you know, put all their eggs into, you know, this will let <laughs> me know with a hundred percent certainty, nothing, you know, in future markets are ever that certain, but yeah. it will help. No, it's a cyclical market. And all us, I hate to say I'm an old timer, but all us old timers are saying, you know, we've had it good for a pretty long while. This has been a real big up cycle. And, you know, it, the other shoe could drop any moment in terms of just whether the fish show up. Um, back in the day, in can days, it was uh, E. coli or uh, what was that? you know, thing with the can botulism, boy, if you, you got a batch of botulism in your cans, it just wiped out the market and you just went, Oh, there it goes. So there it's very dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. You never know what black swan's going to hit, you know, botulism or pandemic or whatever. Um, yeah. You know, so knock on wood, good right. fishermen do. Let's, uh, let's jump over to some of the other data that's here. Um, you know, another thing that we hear a lot of times from direct marketers is, you know, where's the market at? What's the market price for fillets or H and G? And yeah, yeah. So this comes a lot of this data comes from the salmon price report, so it's it's laggy, um, but at least gives us a sense of where things are at. You know. Yeah, that's just another. Another picture of the nuts and bolts, but it gives it in a little bit of different timeline. Um, and you can see the trend or, or no trend, which is good sometimes too. Yeah. And it'll be really interesting to see where this uh, future data comes out for sockeye for frozen sockeye fillets, you know, because anecdotally we've heard higher quotes um, from direct marketers that are, you know, buying, buying things back uh, from their, their processors. Um, so, you know, again, this is, we, we hope it's useful information. It's public information. It's just out there in the ether in a lot of different places, not always easy yeah. to put together. So we're yeah. trying to make it more functional. For I, I think a really, a really interesting, it, you get this from the salmon price production 
uh, report. And in that report are eggs, right? So if, yeah, if Roe is in there as well. Maybe I should add that to yeah, this. Yeah, Roe. And I'm really curious because chum Roe has always been very valuable. And we had very low row. So we should have a really, really low supply of ro chum row. That price should really jump. And, and, and when I'm going to look at that just out of curiosity, it doesn't affect our, our price or whatever, but I'm just curious on what's going to happen with the chum row price. And that's well, I'm glad you mentioned that because there's a link to these source data right on at the bottom of the page, Alaska salmon price and production reports. Yep. And, uh, Let's see what row is worth. So these used to but be that's PDFs. through August. So it's right, really August. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you know, so Chum, been... Chum was way down in 2020 too. Like this is not a super new thing with Chum. Yeah. So yeah. so if we go down to row, uh, you know, there so August there. sales, sockeye, um, Chum. It's redacted. Right, for the whole for the whole state. Although if you go up yeah. here, it will show you this is this is by month. Um or excuse me, this is by, by region. Yeah. But up here it it uh, totals out the whole Yes, and you can you can you, know, the whole you thing. can backdoor it that way. Right. So like when we look at Sakai row six oh three for these months versus yeah. chum twenty point two one. Yeah, <laughs> huge, huge, huge. Now, yeah, quite. I a think bit if you looked at it five there. years ago, it wouldn't be there. Right, and that's interesting. I mean, eight hundred and five thousand pounds. I mean, we can look at what it was after last season, a little bit later months too. Here, right, and see. Okay. Yeah. You know, so a lot of that looks like last year. A lot of that got sold after August but still at a really high price. Um, yeah. You know, pink kind of slots in in the middle there, you know, so. But again, I think you can see like with what, and we're always open to suggestions. If you, you know, Eric, if you or other fishermen would like to see this compiled, you know, some other stuff compiled, we're happy to do it. Um, but it's kind of a pain to, you know, jump back yeah. and forth and, do all this stuff. it's it's a lot easier when you see it like this so <laughs> yeah that's what that's why i say we could spend hours and hours but you you've done such a great job and 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 i'm sure you you know have your your uh, i got diamond. this all on a spreadsheet you know it, not yeah. everybody has to type it in themselves and keep their own like let's just have that happen once exactly right? so yeah exactly and you present it in so many different ways you know uh it really is valuable to me. I, I love it. Thanks. Well, it's, you know, that's kind of been how my career's progressed and what, you know, you, you just like with fishing, you know, or anything else, you get better at it over time or you get more comfortable with it. And, and that's, that's been my role largely is to know a lot, not just about how to put this data together, but to know, you know I try to learn as much as I can about the data sets themselves, what weaknesses or strengths they have and that sort of thing. Um, that's also important. So, you know, just real quick, we'll finish up here, but um, fishing game has prices on sockeye from different regions. We post them up here. Um, you know, we, we know that Bristol Bay tends to come in on the lower end compared to other regions, but again, at least you guys can have the data to be aware of that and see how big the difference is. So, yeah. I've asked processors about this. Why, why Bristol Bay? And, you know, they'll, they'll say, well, the sales people, the wholesalers say that, well, Bristol Bay is closer to the source. They're turning color. Um, they're not as good as false pass fish or whatever. Um, I think, you know, our quality programs have come to show that the market that we're really getting way more competitive in quality. So, uh, and I think we've seen better, uh, disparity between the other regions than in the past. Um, but I think a lot of the differences in the price have to do with logistics of where Bristol Bay is compared to Cook Inlet. That That's my take on it. Yeah, you know, in Cook Inlet, they're able to, 
sell a lot of that fish fresh. You know, it's it's not mm -hmm. as compressed as Bristol Bay. None of these other areas are in near the volume that Bristol Bay is um, mm -hmm. outside of maybe, maybe area M a little bit when you look at it on like a per vessel basis, but but they, you know, they get about the same price that Bristol Bay does. Um, but I, I think volume does play into it a little bit, right? It's it's like anything, it's a, it's a market where the supply and the demand finds at what price, I, you know, I guess the data says fishermen are willing to go fish and sell fish for, um, or, or I guess what they got paid, right? But, um, but over time, you know, that's, this is what it is. And again, you know, not really looking to, you know, we just want to make sure you guys have, have the information. I think it makes for the most competitive market that, that we can have uh, when everybody's informed. So, so finally, you know, I think a lot of people know that the CFEC has permit values on their their website and that they lag quite a bit, right? Um, but we we basically use this just as a kind of historical thing to show, okay, here's where the permit value is come and gone. The black line is what CFEC's sort of average permit value is per month. And then these gray bars are the uh, average drift net gross earnings by permit. So, you know, you can kind of see, even when we got back to this level, it was, you know, well, permit prices are high again. Well, yeah, but so is revenue per permit, right? Mm -hmm. um, so again, and I think right now, based on what I've seen on the permit brokers, things are probably more in like the, around the 210 ish a thousand level for permits. So take this info with a grain of salt. It's mostly meant to just kind of give you a bearing on where we're, where permit prices and fishery value per permit, you know, fishery revenue per permit is in relation to each other. So, and I don't know for you, Eric, may, it, this might even be helpful to just think about your different years and think about, well, how much above or below the average was I right in some of these different years and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's a, that that part of it is interesting to say. Okay, well, the average in 2018 was almost 200 grand. Um, you know, did I did I gross that much? And if my crew crew sees that, they'll say, "Oh no, I can't fish for this guy again." <laughs> but uh, <laughs> oh, so, yeah. Yeah. or I did better, and then I, I'm making my crew happy. But uh, I I think this is. Uh, a I think an economics professor would love to see um, this data and, and do a case study in his class or her class for it because um, there's, it's really shareholders, you know, we're shareholders, we have 1800 and some permits and the value of those permits are going to go up if you can make money on them. Um, it's just as simple as that. If people aren't making money, permits go down. If people, you know, um, are making good money, like in 2018, permits are going to go up. We had a good year. We just got bumped. Uh, I think you see uh, after the 20 cent thing got announced uh, at the show a couple weeks ago, uh, I think permits immediately bumped 10 grand. So yeah. they're the last one I saw, and I follow this pretty closely. Um, the last ones I saw at uh, a broker, I think, were uh, 220, 218. Okay. Yeah, that, that sounds about right. And, you know, it's interesting. I mean, even back during these times, you know, it was people were wondering, well, you know, we've seen this run up and crash before, right? Um, yeah. But back in those times, those average earnings were running quite a bit below the permit price. And you just see, you know, kind of coming above the bar here. And even though 2020 was down, you know, there was a lot of financial assistance available and that a lot of fishermen applied for and got. So, you know, if you, if you access those programs, which we put the links and info to on our site, um, you could have gotten, you know, you, you still could have made 2020 into a, a good season or, you know, it, it probably wasn't as bad as it looks here if you use those programs. Um, 
No, and I and I I, I want to say 2020. You know, when we use our numbers from ADF and G and the price report, and you know, again, they don't really reflect some of the later spring adjustments. And and I would I would guess that 2020 really I, it was it wasn't great because of COVID, but in terms of COVID, it was good because we we had a successful season. We haven't been on limits like we used to be on these big seasons. So uh, there are a lot of good things going and that's driving permit and boat prices up. Um, and I, the, the, the scary thing to me is if you looked back in history, the, I think permits capped out at about 285 in the early 90s. And then from there, it was a downward trend to 2000 where they dropped to low as 20,000. And now we've been on this, steady increase uh, for the last really 20 years. Um, and I don't know where it's gonna stop. Hopefully well, it won't. Right, it'll be a function of <laughs> how much, you know, it'll be a function of earnings and profits and things like that, right? Um, as yeah. well as interest rates. So, you know, there's there's all sorts of things that affect it. But, um, but again, hopefully this is useful for you guys, even if it does lag, you know, there's times where the market for permits like goes up and down and if it's flat for a while, then, you know, this will be pretty reflective of that. But in a market that's kind of escalating, like you mentioned, if the bids are up to 220, you know, or the offers are, yeah, like, you know, past sales are going to lag it to some degree. But um, anyway, I think for mm -hmm. some people that that are looking at, you know, if you're looking at fishing in a different area and you're looking at um, maybe getting into the bay and you're kind of thinking about, well, boy, price, you know, permit prices are here and this is where they used to be. But, you, you know, the price of a permit should really be, like I say, a function of, of what the earnings are in the fishery. So mm -hmm. it's really important to understand both of these bars and, and, kind of the their relative relationship if you're evaluating buying or selling a permit i would say you know yeah the due diligence that you should do so i'd be i'd be really curious andy did i mean we've had these huge huge years and and production has been our friend but you know when, when we get to a 32 million prediction and we produce 24 million uh fish caught that will be really interesting to see what happens um, uh, with with the graphs and which what direction they go, and that that will be really um, um, to me because the price the price will need to go up for us to survive at, at, at you know at these levels of the of the same profitability. Yeah, well. Interesting is one way to put a, that situation, but <laughs> at, you know, yeah, it's a wild fishery and we don't control what comes back. And um, there's probably only so much the market can absorb. And it, you know, like we saw it in 2013, price went up quite a bit. Harvest volume was down a lot. Um, so a lot. And the market's been able to absorb it. <laughs> right. You know, but in 2015 too, 2015 was the opposite of that, right? Bigger than expected yeah. harvest, lower than ex maybe expected price. Um, but I, what 2015 did was it, you know, it was good that the fishermen didn't kind of take out the frustration or whatever on the fish. Like we still had quality kept increasing. And because there was good fish, a lot of more good fish than was expected to be produced that year, um, you saw more year round uh, uh, chilled sockeye programs start to develop. You know, I, I think shortly thereafter, or maybe it was even that year, Costco had, uh, you know, started selling sockeye in more of its stores year round. You know, those sorts of things happen as a result of, of those, um, of those situations. So, you know, 2015, sure it was a really just awful bad year for fishermen don't want to like sugarcoat it at all but it there is you know for every one of those actions there's a reaction dark clouds and silver linings and all but i mean it's 
It's true. Luckily, it was short lived. Right. You know, that, that's what, it was short lived. And uh, I, as a fisherman, the, the worst part about 2015 or even the COVID years was uh, crew, you know, the retention of crew. Uh, you know, uh, fishermen, we're vested in it. We're going we're gonna, to, you know, stick it out whether we lose money one year and, and we're because we the next year. But, but to get and retain and, and keep good crew when they get whacked with a, a bad year, they, it, they're less motivated to stay. Uh, that's, that's a very good point, Eric. Yeah. Yeah. Cause even when you average 14 and 15 out, it, you know, comes in around what had been happening there. Right. Um, but yeah, yeah. Like, it's a different thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a, that's a run through of the data sets that are there. Um, and there's a whole bunch more here. If that's, you know, not enough to satisfy your guys' appetite. Um, you know, you're probably aware of the forecasts. Uh, we have a video from our market or from our member meeting that goes through, you know, kind of summarizes market conditions. But I also want to draw people's attention to this all hands on deck from ASME conference. Um, there's a lot there. ASME does a once a year all hands on deck event. Literally, they have contractors and marketers from around the world come to uh, to Anchorage, or it's it's been virtual in the last few years. But you know, they they pull together an incredible amount of information from um, all species around the world, and you know, so you can go there and look at presentations and discussion, and that sort of thing. So, and a whole bunch more here, you know, a lot of the data that we get comes from these sort or that we're putting up here comes from these sources. There's news from Fish Radio and Tradex and, um, you know, uh, kind of other radio segments, but. Oh, and then. Uh, yeah. I was going to say that a lot of guys have been watching the Tradex ones, you know, because it's just a quick blurb about what's happening. They, they've been, they've been pretty popular the last couple of years, the little Tradex video links yeah, on um, those social three minute media. Yeah, insights are great. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, people should definitely check. Not as good as all the information you give. <laughs> well, you know, it, it's all good. Sometimes I see stuff that they're doing like, ooh, that's really interesting. And, and some, uh, you know, there's plenty of times where they reference stuff that we're putting up too. So, you know, it's always great to have more people looking into this. And Tradex does a really nice job putting it together in those videos. Um, you know, fan of what they're doing there too. So, um, you know, for those of you who are who are still sticking with us here, if you haven't, sign up for the Waypoints newsletter, I would say. We put it out once a month. It's an e-newsletter. Um, there's a sign-up button. We really just try to simplify and summarize what happens, what's been going on in, um, each month. So it's, it's pretty short stuff. You can click on the links if you want to know more. Um, I think that's the easiest way to keep up with what the RSDA is doing for you guys and take advantage of things that might help you like this uh, tax planning uh, webinar that we had on Wednesday. Um, so pretty easy, you know, tool there, but I don't know. Any final thoughts, Eric, um, on the whole market information side of it? No, it's, there's a lot to digest, like I said, and uh, I, I think if people just regularly look at uh, the information you update, they'll get a good feel of what, what the fishing market is doing for us or isn't right it ebbs and flows just like the tide so well thanks for doing this with me today eric i think it really helped give the yeah i hope so I, I appreciate your help with everything you're doing absolutely absolutely and if anybody has questions out there um don't be shy you can hit me on email at andy at bbrsda.com um you know, happy to answer questions about this and, and post up different info if there's other ways you guys want to see this sliced. So um, please, we're here to, you know, work for the fleet. And, uh, but sometimes we need that feedback, so. Yeah, all the right. more feedback, the better. That's right, exactly. All right, well, thanks yeah. for all the Bristol Bay fishermen out there. Um, hope you find this data useful and this video helpful. And uh, we'll see you again down the road. Uh, 
Um, so I'm going to 